Thank you. Um, so I've got a lot to talk about, not a whole lot of time. I'm going to jump right in. So uh, Racket is a project about a lot of things. It's, it's also a lot about languages. Um, and this makes sense, because Racket comes from a long heritage of Lisps, which have used the macro system to create embedded domain-specific languages for years and years and years, decades. Uh, and, and this is not unique to Lisps. There's a lot of languages that, that can do this too. But most of the time in other languages, it's called metaprogramming. And metaprogramming is kind of a dirty word in programming languages. Um, or in the programming community at large. It's equated with just write-only code. Nobody knows how it works, not even the person who wrote it. And, uh, and so as an example of that, this is C++ template metaprogramming. If the text is too small to read, it doesn't matter. It doesn't help even if you can. Um, this implements a compile time branch and then uses it at the bottom. That's it. That's all it does. But it's really, really difficult to understand. Uh, and so you know, reasonably, people tend to avoid it. This is actually a piece of code that I wrote that's in Ruby. Um, it uses the Ruby meta object protocol to do some sort of runtime metaprogramming. Uh, this is a tiny piece of code that's part of a much bigger blob um, that implements something that makes it easy to sort of decode complicated XML files into Ruby objects. Uh, and the code is actually more than 50% comments, because that was the only way I would have any idea what it does. Lisp macros aren't really actually that much better, though, in a lot of cases. Um, this is a closure macro that implements a for loop. And uh, it's not too bad. It's a pretty simple, small macro, but even then, it's a little bit complicated to see what's going on. Uh, you've got this destructuring, but nothing really indicates what it does. And the worst part is, is that when you misuse them, the error messages you get are pretty much completely worthless, especially if you have a macro that uses a macro that then uh, expands into something that's incorrect. It's pretty much impossible to debug. Racket sidesteps a lot of those issues for two reasons. It has a really, really powerful macro system, and it has syntax parse. And I think syntax parse uh, is actually kind of the killer feature of Racket's macro system. Um, even though it's a derived concept, it's built on top of the rest of the macro system, but it makes it really, really easy to build robust domain-specific languages very, very quickly. Um, and then when things go wrong, you can actually figure out what happened. But while I could spend probably an hour uh, talking about syntax parse, I actually don't want to talk about it too much today. I want to talk about something a little bit different, which I'm sure everybody in this room has probably seen, which is this line at the top of every program. So the first time you used Racket, you might have been really confused. You installed something called Racket. You're using a program called Dr. Racket, and yet at the top of every single one of your programs, you said you were writing Racket. That's really redundant. Why, why would you do that? Um, and it turns out that really quickly, you probably realized that's not the only language. There's not just Hashling Racket. There's Hashling Typed Racket for a typed version of Racket, Hashling Lazy for a lazy version of Racket. So you might have thought, OK, uh, this is a way for sort of customizing the semantics of Racket in, in little ways. But that's not true either, because you have things like Scribble Manual for writing documentation. You have things like Datalog, which doesn't even have S expressions. It doesn't even have Racket semantics. Uh, and that's because Racket is really kind of two things. Uh, the first thing it is is it's a platform that is composed of a compiler, a macro expander, a virtual machine, and some other basic libraries to implement uh, everything else. And then there's the Racket language, which is built on top of it. And, and these are actually fairly decoupled. Uh, a lot of the stuff in the Racket platform is actually designed specifically for the Racket language, because a lot of the stuff that goes in the Racket language needs stuff to be implemented at a lower level, but now it's pretty complete, and you can implement a lot of other languages on top of it really, really easily. And they don't even necessarily have to be anything like Racket, and I think that's really, really cool. And there's really no other system that has that kind of potential. But uh, while you know, we just heard a talk about Rosette, which is a language which uses a lot of these features, I wanted to see how much of this proposition of how quickly you could actually build an entirely new language with totally different semantics, totally different syntax, um, and how hard it would be to get something like that in Racket. And so I implemented a programming language called Tulip. Now, Tulip, there was a, actually a strange loop talk about it. Um, it's not a language that I have invented or even designed, but, and it's not even done. <laughs> but I figured it would be, it would be a, a, a really cool example because you can take a look at the syntax and it really doesn't look like Racket at all. Uh, it looks a little bit more ML-y, but even then, it's really unique. And, and so it has a lot of interesting features in the sense that it has pattern matching. Um, it has uh, automatic currying of functions. And so I wanted to see how hard it would be to actually get this working. So for context, I spent about two weeks uh, implementing this. And that's a really, really short amount of time um, to implement an entire programming language. And, and this is uh, only a partial implementation of a partially finished language. So that's not saying a whole lot. But I wanted to sort of show off how much you can get in a really, really short period of time. So I'm actually going to give a quick little demo. Um, if I can. So here you go. This is that program. Let's see if I can make the text a little bigger. 
This is that program in Dr. Racket. And so the first thing I want to do is obviously you can run it, uh, which is not super exciting. Um, so this is just a really simple program that implements a map function and then maps over a list. Uh, I haven't actually implemented the syntax for, for better lists, so I'm just using explicit cons pairs. But so you can see that it actually works. And you get a REPL, so um, I can implement a really, really quick lambda function. So maybe I'm going to add, or let's say subtract one from x times two, and apply it to seven, and I get 13. It all works. Uh, and this is all something that you might expect out of a very simple interpreter for something that you could write in two weeks. That's not too infeasible. But this uh, is much more than an, than an interpreter. It's actually a fully jitted compilation uh, l compiled language of Tulip because it uses all the existing Racket infrastructure. But that in and of itself is not the coolest thing about this. So I wanna, I wanna sort of show off some of the things that I got basically for free uh, by implementing this stuff on, on the Racket platform. So the first thing I wanna show off is that if, uh, if I click this check syntax button up in the top, well, the first thing I actually wanna show is that it's all syntax highlighted property, properly. Dr. Racket does not have support built in for syntax highlighting uh, tulip code, but, but if I write a comment which you know, starts with a, a hash sign, that's not Racket syntax. It all gets syntax highlighted properly, and that I got just by implementing the language and basically reusing the existing lexer I had already built. Uh, the other thing is that if I click this check syntax button, Dr. Racket actually knows how to highlight it even more specifically. So all the identifiers I define in this module get this sort of light blue color. Uh, sort of the darker blue color are, are identifiers I imported. And so, and then the sort of like darkest color is stuff that's just datums. Um, and the green is used for literals. As well as this, uh, these, these imports, which again are totally unique to Tulip. And, and that's really, really cool. I didn't even do any work to get that. I just got that completely for free. So then the other thing is that if, if I hover over this, um, this, this map identifier, I get the Dr. Racket binding arrows, which everyone's seen before if you use Dr. Racket. Um, but there's another uh, cooler example. I mean, obviously this also works for all the function arguments. But um, Tulip has sort of uh, Haskell-style definitions with pattern matching where you have multiple sequential definitions uh, of the same identifier, which just have different patterns. And so there's actually two binding areas. Um, and, and Dr. Racket, of course, just handles that totally fine, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, but then, you know, all of this is, is really, really nice. You know, I can, I can, uh, I can mouse over some of these, these imports and it'll show me what I imported from each module. If I hover over these, it tells me where, where it came from. If I right click on this, I can open the defining file and it'll tell me um, you know, the module that it was implemented in. And again, all of this in two weeks, which is really, really impressive given that uh, I don't think anybody could implement even half this tooling in that amount of time for a completely new language. But the coolest thing about this, this entire thing is that um, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of new languages, it's really hard to figure out what goes wrong when you use them incorrectly. The, the debugging tooling is really, really bad. So like for example, um, here I'm applying a partially applied multiplication function to this list. But what if I mistype this and I just put two here instead of the multiplication function? In a lot of languages, this would just blow up. Uh, early languages, sometimes it would just seg fault. Sometimes it would just die without an error message. Sometimes you'd get a type error, which is pretty good. But Dr. Racket can do one better. Because if I run this program, it does that. And that's really, really awesome. Um, and, and again, I implemented this, uh, or I, didn't, I, didn't, I did almost nothing to get this kind of functionality. And Dr. Racket just gives me this instrumentation completely for free. Um, and so I think there's, there's really no other system out there that can do this. And so that's, that's all I'm gonna demonstrate of this. I'm gonna go back to the presentation. So what I figured out is that Racket really is an unparalleled language laboratory. If you're interested in implementing a general purpose programming language, Racket is absolutely the platform for you. Check it out. It's really, really awesome, and it's really, really easy to do. And even though I, I'm not gonna talk about it too much, I did as a part of this, which I cheated a little, I didn't include it in the two weeks. I implemented a parsing library called Megaparsac, which is specifically tailored for parsing languages because it emits Racket syntax objects. So if you use that library or something like it, then you can basically just implement a parser like you would in any other programming language and you'll get all of these nice features for free because the source locations will already be included. Um, and I'll have a link to that at the end. But so the question is what about domain specific languages? There's a lot of general purpose programming languages in the Racket ecosystem. There's Racket, there's Type Racket. Scribble kind of blurs the line. It's, it's a very powerful programming language, it's Turing complete, but it's obviously used for a very specific purpose, but it's still a very, very big language. Uh, and, and in Racket, we implement a lot of domain-specific languages using macros. 
And so there is kind of this line between embedded and standalone DSLs. Uh, you have things like syntax parse, active record, and Ruby, jQuery, and JavaScript that just use the host languages, syntax and semantics. You have standalone languages. But we don't actually see that many people, like I, I write, when I write racket code, I write macros all the time, and it takes me seconds. Uh, but nobody's gonna sit down and be like, oh, I want a hashlang that, that has like a really specific syntax for defining a schema. Uh, nobody's doing that. And, and so I kind of was asking myself why. Because if you look at other domains, like math, we have really specific syntaxes for math. And um, you know, if you don't know the syntax, it's really confusing. But if you do know the syntax, it's way easier to understand than, than spelling it out. But in programming, we don't really do that very often. And, and even though you know, I work with Haskell for a living, and Haskell has infix operators, and there is some benefit to having sort of a visual contour of infix operators rather than using S expressions. But the ability to define these um, the ability to define infix operators is not enough of an advantage to justify the cost of, of basically giving up all the syntax easiness that you get out of S expressions. So the question is, why aren't people doing that? And, and I mean, the thing is that when you edit programs textually, you really only get access to lines. You don't get access to really anything else. You can't even edit by columns. You just get lines of text. And, and I think that's really, really limiting. And so to some extent, we're not using the advantages of, of having this totally arbitrary syntax because there's not a whole lot we can do, and most of the time I would just prefer an S expression macro. So with all that said, I was thinking, what, how could we make that better? And, and so the, bear with me for a moment, the obvious, uh, or maybe not the obvious, next step is graphical programming. And, and this is kind of a big leap because people have tried this before. You have stuff like Scratch, uh, which maybe works kind of well for educational settings, but obviously is, is really, really horrible if you're writing actual programs. And the other thing that I've seen is patch-based programming languages, which, as you can see, uh, very quickly become literal spaghetti code. <laughs> and, um, and these are really, really horrible. You know, how, basically, people decided that graphical programming was a mistake. We're going back to text. The graphical programming is too complicated. And, and I think maybe to some extent that's true. But these, are general, these tend to be fairly general purpose programming languages. What about domain-specific languages? And <laughs> Because uh, if you have a domain-specific language, if you're able to actually use uh, a domain-specific language and, and tailor, basically focus on a very, very specific thing, you can define, you can build your languages like user interfaces, where you can actually completely ignore most of the problems of implementing control flow, uh, you know, loops, branch, branches, um, handling all the different types of operators that people want to define. And I mean, imagine, imagine if instead of writing a big long tree of S expressions or some hibernate annotations or some active record stuff, when you want to define your schema, you got this. So this is, a, uh, this is, this is just a um, SQL client that I happen to have on my computer. I did not write it, but, um, but it's really, really cool. And this is a really great interface for editing a schema. And um, really, I don't think there's any reason that you couldn't use this as the interface to a language. Similarly, if you wanted to define a UI, why not use a visual system to define a user interface? Uh, similarly, even for defining a slideshow, we have a Hashlink slideshow, but it's really far removed. You edit the code, you run it, you see what it looks like. It's not quite what you want. You go back, you edit the code. Why can't it look like this? That would be really neat. And, uh, <laughs> I would totally use that. Um, I did not use slideshow for this presentation precisely for that reason. So the question is, though, is this, is this too far off? Is this way too complicated? And I don't think so, because I think a lot of the time people look at these and they, you know, these are fully featured applications. Of course, you're not going to be able to build one of these things in an afternoon. But we have syntax parse. And really what these are in my head is just a visual macro. So, uh, so you import syntax GUI. You define some graphical syntax, and just like using syntax parse, you define, instead of something that parses S expressions, you actually define something that basically lays out some basic graphical components. And, and these don't have to be pretty. You know, you, you have a trade-off between making it really, really easy to use and making it really, really nice, um, but, or easy to write versus making it really, really easy to use and really nice for the end user. But this would allow you to create something really, really simple, and then it's just, it expands to S expressions. And it ties into the entire rest of the racket system with the macro expander, um, arbitrary module languages, and everything else. Now, syntax GUI doesn't exist yet. <laughs> it would be really, really cool if it did. I don't think that there's necessarily a barrier to implementing it, but work. There's a lot of unsolved problems around graphical syntax to this day. 
um, how to maintain a mapping back and forth between the text and the, and the graphics, what do you render it, how do you make it so that you're not tied to a specific editor. I think unfortunately maybe web tech is the only way to do that to make it sort of platform independent and, and editor independent, but I think that they're solvable problems. Stuff like diffing tools is, is difficult too, but I think they're solvable problems. But that's all really, really out there. So, so coming back a little bit, again, um, the, if, if, you, if, you, if that's too crazy for you, that's okay. Uh, the takeaways are syntax parse helps you build really, really robust domain-specific languages in absolutely minutes. And, and there's really, I, I've worked with other lists, I've worked with Clojure. Clojure has kind of drifted away from macros because they're not robust enough, they're really, really complicated to maintain. Racket uh, has embraced them, and I think that's really, really wonderful, and it, and it allows for things like typed Racket, Rosette, and all the other projects in the Racket ecosystem. Um, Hashlang turns Racket into a language greenhouse, which is, again, I think pretty much unmatched by any, anything else uh, in the programming language community, and maybe someday we can use uh, the macro system to, to make graphical syntax a little bit more practical, a little bit more feasible, and not so impossible. That's it, that's all I got. Questions? Questions. <coughs> Alex, you have known, but uh, the grant that just finished, that just, that you just wrapped up, was called Racket, the hothouse for new languages. <laughs> so I, I should have called it Greenhouse, uh, but I, I, my English is not good enough, so I couldn't think of that word. Uh, but I have a challenge for you. Since you are a 19-year-old who justifiedly skips college because it's a waste of time, uh, congratulations to that, uh, why don't you use the spare time that you've left over and, and export syntax parse to closure? <laughs> so, so first of all, why? Um, because I think closure is our brother and sister community. Mm -hmm. We're extremely close to them. And uh, language communities should not live in isolation, but should actually embrace each other when there is an opportunity. And this would be an easy thing to bridge a gap and then move things through that first uh, wormhole back and forth between closure and racket. Maybe if we donate something first, they may donate data thingies back to us. <laughs> so, so first of all, I don't, I don't write any closure. Um, so. Yes, yes. I have a book. I have a the, book. <laughs> the, the, more, the more, I think, because I, I have thought about this, and, and the trouble is a lot, syntax parse is built on top of a lot of Racket microsystem features that don't exist in Clojure. There's no, there's no hygiene, there's no, there's no source locations. And, um, and, you know, things like syntax classes are... are <laughs> So, so I think a lot of those things might be translatable to Clojure, but it would definitely um, be different. I don't know what that would entail. All right, well, thank you so much, Alexis.